Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is a challenging one entitled The Role of the Church in the Community. Have you thought about that recently? Well, this is lesson number three in that series entitled Justice and Mercy in the Old Testament, Part 1. And this is the lesson for July 16 of 2016. We hope you've got your thinking caps on, your plans for what you're going to do, and your Bible handy, and let's begin with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, we thank you for these opportunities we have to come together to talk about you and to think about your word. Draw near to us as we consider some very challenging issues that face us at this end time. May we do your will, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. We are all pretty much familiar with what it says in Exodus 20. Those are the Ten Commandments. But a short distance after that, Exodus 22, starting with verse 21, there's some very interesting words that we would like, I would like to start with. Do not ill-treat or oppress a foreigner. Remember that you are foreigners in Egypt. Do not ill-treat any widow or orphan. If you do, I, the Lord, now that's the, that's the word for Yahweh, the personal name for God, will answer them when they cry out to me for help. And I will be angry and kill you in war. Your wives will become widows and your children will be fatherless. Does that sound like a threat? Yes. <laughs> Doesn't sound too friendly, does it? Sounds pretty vengeful. Vengeful. Well, we're going to look at a number of other verses that are going to sound a little like that as well. Um, anyway, the point is that in these lessons, we're, we're going to talk about how we as a church and we as individuals deal with the poor, the widows, the orphans around us. Um, in this particular lesson, of course, we're focusing on mostly on early parts of the Old Testament. And I guess it's pretty clear from that statement how God feels about widows and orphans. There's a, an introduction, introductory comment story from our Bible study guide I would like to read to sort of set the stage here. Years ago, on a cold day in New York City, a 10-year-old boy, barefoot and shivering, peered in the window of a shoe store. A woman came to the boy and asked why he was looking so earnestly in the window. He said that he was asking God to give him a pair of shoes. The woman took him by the hand into the store. She asked the clerk to bring six pairs of socks. She also requested a basin of water and a towel. Taking the lad to the back of the store, she removed her gloves, washed his feet and dried them with the towel. The clerk returned with the socks. The woman placed a pair on the boy's feet and then bought him a pair of shoes. <clears throat> she patted his head and asked him if he felt more comfortable now. As she turned to go, the astonished lad took her hand and tearfully asked, Are you God's wife? And our lesson goes on to comment, That little boy spoke more truth than he realized. God's church is his bride, as we know from several passages in the Bible. His character is expressed in the memory verse for this week, Psalm 146 to 7 to 9. Maybe we should just look at that. He judges in favor of the oppressed and gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets prisoners free and gives sight to the blind. He lifts those who have fallen. He loves his righteous people. He protects the strangers who live in our land. He helps widows and orphans but takes the wicked uh, to their ruin. That's a pretty plain statement. As transformed members of his church, we must reflect that character. If we are truly his, we will passionately care about and provide for the poor and the powerless. What's the difference between a prisoner and the wicked? The previous passage that you read said that he frees the prisoners, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then later on it 
He well, takes the wicked to task. I thought the wicked were in jail. What, what's well, that might be true more or less in our time, but in ancient times, many of those who were in prison were people who were captured uh, in war and things like that. So they weren't necessarily criminals per se. So what was God's original plan for all of us? His original plan? Garden of Eden. We were all supposed to be living in the Garden of Eden. None of this should have happened. We, we were thrust into this mess by, of course, sin. And we now live in a sin-cursed world. A world filled with greed and injustice and cruelty. But in God's dealing with his children, social justice has been a part of his laws and ideals for his people. It has always been God's plan for people to have their needs met, to flourish, and to have peace Rain. Does that sound like something that's happening every day? It depends on where you live. Yeah, it does. It depends on where you live, exactly. Well, let me just pick a couple of other spots. Look at Exodus 23, verse 9. I'm sorry, 2 through 9. Do not follow the majority when they do wrong or when they give evidence that perverts justice. Do not show partiality to a poor person at his trial. So you don't always give special privileges to the poor. If you happen to see your enemy's cow or donkey running loose, take it back to him. If his donkey has fallen under its load, help him get the donkey to its feet again. Don't just walk off. Do not deny justice to a poor person when he appears in court. Do not make false accusations and do not put an innocent person to death. For I will condemn anyone who does such an evil thing. Do not accept a bribe for a bribe makes people blind to what is right and ruins the cause of those who are innocent. Do not ill-treat a foreigner. You know how it feels to be a foreigner because you were foreigners in Egypt. And at the point where Moses was giving this information to the children of Israel, they had just come out of slavery, hadn't they? Do you think that these people thought it was okay to do all that? Well, I guess probably... My question was, were they doing it? Well, they might have been doing it, but did they think it was okay that God had to tell them not to do it? Well, I, 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 it's hard for us with our Christian background to think that anybody would ever think this was okay, but they certainly did it. Now, there are some cultures where a bribe is just part of the... Yeah. <clears throat> you to get through through customs or to uh, have a policeman. Um, uh, a policeman in some cultures will stop you for almost no real just cause at all. And the way you get out of it is to you know, just, just to pay the money. Well, I've heard stories of Christians smuggling Bibles over by bribing, mm. bribing guarders. Well, so is that good? You may not even have to. There, there are some who <coughs> smuggle Bibles without having to bribe. <laughs> well, that's true. I, I don't know if one is any worse than the other, if you really think I, about I, I it. I do remember hearing missionaries talk about, uh, they were a little chagrined about it. They were just being frank about, you know, they were someplace in, in a circumstance where they were about their work, and in order to carry on, they had yeah. to give somebody some money to, to get going, because that was the culture. Yeah. That was just, you know, it's part of what's expected. There mm -hmm. are some places in this world where it's considered the smart thing to do to cheat someone out of mm -hmm. stuff. Mm -hmm. you know, all these things that, you, that were described in Exodus 23, that's the good thing to do if you can yeah. get away with it. Yeah. There are some cultures that, uh, um, rather primitive cultures by, by my analysis, but some misfortune befalls you, uh, that's what you laugh at. Yeah. You laugh at somebody who's had some Well, there are, there are a number of cultures and places where I used to work that uh, this kind of stuff is not a sin unless you get caught. Mm -hmm. It's a sin to get caught. It's not a sin to rob or steal or, or that kind of stuff, but it's a sin to get caught. Okay. Well, our lesson does something interesting in this context. It says that there are three Sabbaths, three different kinds of Sabbaths talked about in the Old Testament that might have some implications for what we're saying, what we're talking about. We, I'm sure everyone at this table is very familiar with the Exodus 28 to 11, which we call the fourth commandment. It's the Sabbath commandment. 
And, you know, in this verses, one of the ways in which we are to be fair to others is we're supposed to let everyone, including even our animals, rest on the Sabbath. Slaves, animals, foreigners, everybody. Okay. Then there was a seventh year Sabbath. What do we know about the seventh year Sabbath? Well, often, um, often if you were involved in uh, horticulture or agricultural pursuits, uh, your land was supposed to just lay, f what, what was the term, fallow, just yeah. leave it alone for a year about every seven years. And yeah. And I quote from Exodus 23, verses 10 and 11, For six years sow your field and gather in what it produces. But in the seventh year let it rest and do not harvest anything that grows on it. The poor may eat what grows there, and the wild animals can have what is left. Do the same with your vineyards and your olive trees. So it's a year of, I mean, if you're a subsistence farmer and you're leaving your fields fallow for a year, what do you do? Well, you break your farm up into seven parts. <laughs> so is this everyone doing the same thing every uh, at the same time, or is it... You're on a cycle, as as Jen, as yeah. That's a good question. And because it, it, you know the people who lived in the city, how are where are they going to get food? Yeah. If they don't have a farm. Yeah. There must have been something set up because when we get to the next one here, the year yeah. of jubilee, there was it wasn't something that you initiated. There was something that was already in process, which mm -hmm. we'll see in a moment. Yeah. Maybe, then I, should, maybe I should do that with my lawn. <laughs> I just. <laughs> Divided One in seventh every year, I just don't do anything with. <laughs> Your neighbors would love you. <laughs> well, they would have to store up, I suppose, so that they had... But well, God promises, doesn't he? Yeah. He says, if you do this, I will take care of you on those times. Yeah. More than that, there was a jubilee year Sabbath. Leviticus 25, verses 10 to 17 says this, In this way you shall set the 50th year apart and proclaim freedom to all the inhabitants of the land. So 50th year would be seven years of seven. You get to 49, don't you? And then the 50th year, so you're going to have a time where there's two years in a row without going anything or not anything intentional. During this year, all property that has been sold shall be restored to the original owner or his descendants. And anyone who's been sold as a slave, or sh slave shall return to his family. You shall not sow your fields or harvest the corn that grows there by itself or gather the grapes or your unpruned vineyards. Now, where it says corn there, it's actually, this is a British translation, so it means actually wheat. But the whole year shall be sacred for you. You shall eat only what the fields produce of themselves. So now you can, you can harvest some, but it's just whatever the field produces of its own, by itself. And this year, all property that has been sold shall be restored to its original owner. So when you sell land, so obviously this has to be, this is not you're doing it this year and somebody else is doing it another year. This is a nationwide affair. When you sell your land to your fellow Israelite or buy land from him, do not deal unfairly. The price is to be fixed according to the number of years the land can produce crops before the next year of restoration. So clearly this is, you know, there's a cycle here. If there are many years, the price should be higher, but if there are only a few years, the price should be lower because what is being sold is the number of crops the land can produce. Do not cheat a fellow Israelite, but obey the Lord your God. I have a question there. It says, yeah. do not uh, cheat your fellow Israelite. How about the <laughs> foreigner? Well, if you're out killing the foreigner, is that, uh, how does that relate to cheating him? You get rid of him, you don't have to cheat. Why didn't it, why didn't it just say, do not cheat period, instead of do not cheat your fellow Israelite? Good question. Maybe they were the, Israelites were the only ones participating in the <coughs> sabbatical. Yeah, well that's probably the, true. The so is this their version of renting land? Yes. yes. So they're going to pay more for the land if they start the first year after it's rest or given, given back. Mm -hmm. And then as it goes on closer to the time it gets given back, they have to pay less for the land. Mm -hmm. So They don't have to. It's just that would be the wise. That's going to be the, the result of the business economics. Well, I Nobody assume does. that they're wise, so that's why I say you have to. <laughs> I have a problem with that. Yeah. Because if you buy land and then no matter what, it, you lose it at the end of at least yeah. 50 years. Well, 
you only pay for the rental, the the crop. I mean, right? Yeah, is, that's what it is. You know how much so cr many no crops. You know how many crops it's going to make before you have to go back, and that's the money you give to them. Does this that. apply primarily to farmland? Probably, probably. But then remember, we're talking about a society where when they entered the land of Canaan. Every family, every tribe, every clan, whatever you choose to call them, was assigned their territory, and that's it. And you're, you're, that's what, I mean, Joseph and Mary, when the tax was called, they had to go back to Bethlehem because that was their home territory. So that's, they, they were linked. Everybody was linked. And the Levites, who didn't have a tribal territory, they had cities. They had 48 cities assigned to them, scattered out through the country. And... That was their territory. So the original owner was what? Was that the tribe, or it was it was the family probably? And I mean, you know, I mean, yeah, we after, can after several hundred years. How does how do you know who's the original owner? That's the well. It goes well, back if it goes back every fifty years. All you have to have is a fifty-year memory. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. Some well, of us I, even now have that. <laughs> I hear you. And, and, and so it says here, I'm commenting, I mean following the, the, the lesson study guide, but I'm also saying this, some of this is from the Ministry of Healing. The year of Jubilee came on the 50th year after seven Sabbath years. Property that was sold was restored to the original owner. Debts were forgiven. Prisoners and slaves were set free. Jubilee was an equalizer of society, a reboot to give everyone an opportunity to begin anew. It was a safeguard, and this is the words from Ellen White, a safeguard against the extremes of either wealth or want. Does that sound like it would work to you? I don't think so. Not, not in this day and age, absolutely not. Well, Some people can be very clever and buy, and buy the use of land and make themselves very rich. Okay. Shall, I, shall I tell you what? My example of that is, I had the privilege of working in East Africa for a number of years. We got to be good friends with a husband and wife team that were working out there. He was actually the uh, manager of the one tire company in all of Tanzania. So he, they made all the tires for Tanzania. Hmm. And his father had been in the tire business as well. And uh, what had happened was, his father was the one who was actually assigned to be responsible for tires for the entire United States during the Second World War. So his father was the one coordinating all the tire companies during the Second World War. And um, he, the father now, after the war was over, he was one of just a handful of people that was sent over. Well, and what had happened actually is before the war, he had worked in Germany spoke fluent German. After the war, he was, he, because he spoke fluent German, he was one of the people sent back to Germany to start with, with the Marshall Plan, to reestablish German. And they got there, and they, there were people from different, you know, especially France and England and, and Russia there trying to organize how they're going to do things in this bl blown out country. And after they looked around for a while trying to figure out how they are going to do things, they realized that the banking system was completely corrupt. There was, all the records were gone. There was nothing like this. So they said, okay, and so he, one, one, I've forgotten what day of the week was, he told us, I think it was Tuesday night. They invited everybody, he invited all these people who were involved to his house to sit down and talk about what they were going to do. And it was in his house that they invented the Deutschmark. They said, there's no way for us to figure out who owes ho how much and why or whatever. So they sat down, they said, we're just going to invent a new currency, the Deutschmark, and then we're going to give everybody who's a legitimate German 40 Deutschmarks. And how long do you think it took before some were very rich and some were very poor? Almost no time at all. Hmm. So there's a modern example. So. So they were, the Deutschmark was worth enough that some people wanted to collect them, huh? Well, of course, yeah, exactly. I mean, it's, <coughs> it's like just inventing paper money, <laughs> and then you give well, it out. No, they, they, uh, they had, I mean, other nations were standing behind the value of this money at that point in time. Oh, okay. That could, yeah. I mean, that's why he was there. 
Mm -hmm. I mean, you know. Yeah, okay. The United States invested a huge lot of money in the Marshall Plan and rebuilt, rebuilt Europe. But not just the United States, but especially the United States. Mm. Well, look at Genesis 2, 1 to 3. This is a very familiar passage. And so the whole universe was completed. By the seventh day, God finished what he had been doing and stopped working. He blessed the seventh day and set it apart as a special day. Because by that day, he had completed his creation and stopped working. And that is how the universe was created. Now, we know that that's what we call the first of the seventh day Sabbaths, right? Did they have Sabbath in heaven? Well, I was about to ask you a question sort of like that. How do we determine when it's the seventh day? <coughs> Depending on which side of the time uh, zone. We assume that it hasn't gone out of sync since I, that. Well, but, but not by only. The we determine it by the rotation of, of the. Our Earth. Of our Earth and, and the Sun in our solar system. And we also know, even just in our solar system, that every single planet rotates at a different speed. So. There's no reason to believe that the, our, uh, we should be the time clock for the universe, that everybody ought to worship on our seventh day. So we don't know. What, we, we have no records of what other places do, how they worship on the Sabbath, a Sabbath, or what kind of a Sabbath in heaven. We just don't know. We do know in Isaiah 66 that when God comes back with his kingdom, establishes, reestablishes the new heavens and a new earth here on planet Earth that we will continue to worship on our Sabbath. But at that time, it seems reasonable that the universe might follow this Earth. Possibly at that point when God has made his headquarters here. Well, it's kind of hard for time to be constant all over the universe, though. Yeah, I know. That's only, only if God declared it so. <coughs> Well, let me just read the verse that I was just commenting about, Isaiah 66. Just as the new earth and the new heavens will endure by my power, so your descendants and your name will endure. On every new moon festival, on every Sabbath, people of every nation will come to worship me here in Jerusalem, says the Lord. Okay? So, apparently the Sabbath, the seventh day Sabbath is going to continue. Um, and there's no evidence that people will be treated differently on that day. Everybody will be treated the same as far as we know when we get to heaven. Which is, I, I have lots of questions about that, which we probably don't have time to discuss right now. Are we going to all speak the same language? Or we'll all be able to speak multiple languages? Because, I mean, how many different languages have there been from Adam and Eve to us? I mean, Tanzania, where I live, for seven years had 120 languages in one country. Now, are we all going to speak the heavenly language? And what about, I mean, when you stop to think about that, that means what, who's, whose culture are we going to adopt? Because language is determined by culture. You know, all our idioms and so forth, they're culturally determined. Well, English, you know, has a lot of languages from yeah. other languages sure. and those cultures are gone but the language is still here so I don't know if the culture has to be the same. Well no what we have done what uh, what Americans have done we we like that and we want some of that and we like this and we like that and we just we just pick what we like from all these other languages and we have I jokingly I remember a story about a couple that were in, on vacation in Germany and they decided they needed to go to some place where there was real German culture. Of course, neither one of them spoke German. So they get to this rural area and there's some kind of a community gathering there and so, oh, we're gonna, we're gonna really experience German culture. And then, and then. Of course, they couldn't talk to anybody. No, they couldn't find anybody who spoke English in this place and so forth. And then someone sneezed on the other side of the room. And, she, and someone said, Gesundheit, which of course is pure German. And the couple said, Ray, there's somebody over there who speaks English. <laughs> 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 I mean, it just shows you how ridiculous. So uh, how, how are we supposed to, uh, there's got to be some kind of a common f ingredient in these three different kinds of Sabbaths here. Yeah. What, what? Well, what our lesson is trying to point out is that these Sabbaths are created to give everybody equal rest, to restore on the, on the Jubilee Sabbath what 
someone might have purchased or whatever, restore you, put you back in your home, original homeland, etc., all that kind of stuff. So that's basically, so if you look here, what shall we learn from these three Sabbaths, the seventh day Sabbath, the seventh, seventh year Sabbath, and the Jubilee Sabbath? Are there lessons that are appropriate for Christians to learn from these Sabbaths? Because obviously these are not given to, to us in a Christian times. These were for the Jews. Are they, are they kind of an equalizer? Is it, was mm -hmm. that another term? I yeah. mean, I never thought about that yeah. on, as a, in regard to the, you know, the seventh day Sabbath, but that's what's happening as the, the servant uh, uh, is able to have time off and, you know, and... And I mean, the idea is, in Bible times, you all went to the synagogue together. In our day, we don't stand at the door and say, well, I don't like the way you're dressed, or you don't have enough money, you can't come in here. Worship is an equalizer. Yeah. Um, it would make it more difficult for some to accumulate great amounts of wealth or land while others were dirt poor. Uh, I'm sure some would figure out how to do most of that, but um, basically that's true. Um, look at Amos 8, verses 4 to 7. Listen to this, you that trample on the needy and try to destroy the poor of the country. You say to yourselves, we can hardly wait for the holy days to be over so that we can sell our corn. That would be wheat again. When, when will the Sabbath end so that we can start selling again? Then we can overcharge, use false measures, and tamper with scales to cheat our customers. We can sell worthless wheat, and if you read Phillips, uh, translation says, the sweeping of the floor. We can sell the sweepings from the floor uh, at a high price. price. We'll find a poor person who can't pay his debts, not even the price of a pair of sandals, and we'll buy him as a slave. The Lord, the God of Israel, has sworn, I will never forget their evil deeds. Now, of course, nobody in our day would do a thing like any of those things, right? Only if I they could disagree. get away with it. Only if they can get away with it. It's hard even to read these words. Merchants were devising all sorts of ways to cheat and abuse the poor people they were dealing with, even on God's Sabbath. I, I deal with poor people all the time, and homeless people as well, as in, in the clinic where I work. Um, let's think of a guy this week that we took care of, and he had a big old knot on the side of his neck, and we asked him what's going on with the big old knot. Well, that's where he had missed the vein when he was trying to inject his heroin. And you know. So how do we? How do, we do we have a year of jubilee and return these people to their, to I don't know, a, some kind of a s state of equality? They if we take the pr my land and we divide it up and they give some of my land to them or. Well, but that's a problem now because w we were. God never assigned us to a particular piece of land or, or anything else like that. So, I mean, we are very small. Maybe at Loma Linda, we're a fairly high proportion of the population, but in terms of the nation, we're a very, I mean, we're one thousandth or something like that of the population of the United States. How are we going to declare a jubilee? I'm more concerned about opening up the jails and the prisons yeah. and the people that are really very not good people. Yeah. Yeah. I'm guessing that people are a lot more violent and... Well, and they have, we have more, more ways to be violent in our day. Yeah. Well, back then, a lot of the people were in jails because they probably found themselves in debt. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah. They throw them in the jail because of that, or else there might have been slaves that ran off or something, and they got captured and thrown sold, in. Sold them, people sold themselves into slavery to pay their debts. Mm-hmm. Well, look at Proverbs 31, verses 8 and 9. What do you do with these verses? Speak up for people who can't speak for themselves. Now, I think we would understand how that could possibly apply to us. Protect the rights of all who are helpless. Mm, yeah, probably. Speak for them and be a righteous judge. Protect the rights of the poor and needy. Do we, I mean, are we now supposed to be correcting the public courts? Well, isn't that speaking to the public courts? <clears throat> I'm, I'm just asking. To everybody. We, we, yeah. I mean, and it depends what situation you're in, wouldn't it? I mean, 
Are you why? under that situation right there that you have to do that? Well, I, I, or do I, you have to find yourself can, a situation and say, "Okay, I'm doing it." Yeah. Well, what, I mean, couldn't it be argued that that's that's built into our to our culture and our judicial system? Um, to be fair. <clears throat> That's why we have laws. The police they they intercede in in situations where there is uh, an unfairness, mm -hmm. and um, sometimes they're directed to to go to a place where there's unfairness, and they will take those people involved in that, and they will bring them into a court system, and the court system seeks to okay. resolve this unfairness. Or <clears throat> we don't have to have. The police are badged authorities in our culture. If I think you owe me some money, then there's a system within our culture, our judicial system, where I can take that to, um, ultimately, if necessary, to my friends and neighbors. You and I have a, a dispute here. I think you owe me this money, and you think you don't, and we're not able to resolve it among ourselves, so we can take that to a jury of our peers, and we can't solve it, so the way we solve it is, so wouldn't that be, so well, wouldn't, me, couldn't, it, couldn't it be argued that, you know, we've, we've kind of built that into our culture? Well, partly. Good and, for and, us. And those are, those, are, those are Christian values that have been <coughs> built into our, and, and I don't think I need to tell any of you that um, there are a lot of people who are trying to eliminate anything Christian at all in, in, our, in our society. Yes. Do we cheat and abuse the poor by hiring attorneys, those who are rich, hiring attorneys that can get us off? Of things mm. and win our case in court? Is that how we're taking advantage of the do, poor? Do some do, that's for sure. So how do you not take advantage of the poor? Well let me let me I, I, I don't know. Let, let me take a very practical example. My again, I have to speak from my world. I work in a federally qualified health center. We do not turn anyone away whether they can pay or whether they can't pay. How is that out of the kindness of your heart or that's the law? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, that's that's our agreement with the federal government. We have a special contract with the federal government to do that. And what and what in return do you get for that? Well, the federal government agrees to pay us a higher rate for the people we do take the other people who do have insurance to help cover that. So we, the federal government co they treat us pretty well. We're not, we're not suffering. Where does the federal government get that money? Get it out and from me. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, but, the, but the question is, even so, I have to take care of those people after they get inside the door. They don't have insurance. I can't send them out. I'm not supposed to send them out anywhere for to have labs, to have x-rays, or whatever. Suppose that somebody comes in and they need surgery. Are we now being fair because I can't get them sent somewhere, can't find anybody who's willing to do free surgery for them? I mean, these are the things I deal with every day. So the federal government steps in only so far. Well, they step in to our our environment. Yeah. We have we have other ways. That we, it's surprising what you can accomplish. We have hospitals around who are willing to do free surgeries for us once or twice a year. They open on the weekend to do free surgeries. I mean, there are ways you can do things, but it's, uh, this is not typical of what happens. Well, the Bible talks a lot about widows and orphans. Um, don't we have systems, don't, hasn't our culture established systems for that? When mm -hmm. <clears throat> we, we have children who have no homes, we have a foster care system. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of flaws, but it's, it's, it's something. Mm -hmm. We have uh, even homes, orphanages, those types of things. Um, we have Medi-Cal, Medicaid. Right. I, I, uh, I, I was surprised to discover there was uh, some people looked to me like they were living under a bridge, and I was talking with a, a social worker about this, and I was surprised. She said, you need to notify the authorities. <clears throat> and I said, well, and have the children taken and I said why why 
that doesn't, I'm, I'm hesitant to have children taken away from their parents. And she said, well, in this particular county, if you, if you are a, a parent with the child, there is um, uh, $57,000 a year available in public funds to, to take care of that. If you have two children, it, turn, it turns out to be about $67,000 when you put the housing allowance and the food and all of this stuff together. And she said, <clears throat> these people in this kind of a circumstance, are the parents are likely taking those monies and using them for drugs, and the children are doing without. And she mm -hmm. advised me to contact the authorities and have this. So wow. to oh. say, say, you know, are we... Do we fit that, that this passage in here where it says you're naughty if you treat people? I, it looks yeah. to me like we do a pretty good job of trying to do the right thing here. Well, okay, yeah, it does. L let me go back to my Old Testament again because that's what we're supposed to be talking about. <coughs> Here's some words from Isaiah, the first chapter of Isaiah. Think about this as, as far as we know, this is I Isaiah's first major speech to Jerusalem, okay? the leaders of Jerusalem. He is a member of the royal family, okay? So he has a little bit, I mean, he's not king or anything like that, but he's a relative of the royal family. So he stands up and he says, Jerusalem, your rulers and your people are like those of Sodom and Gomorrah. It's a great way to start. Listen to what the Lord is saying to you. Pay attention to what our God is teaching you. He says, do not think I want all these sacrifices you keep offering to me. I have had more than enough of the sheep you burn as sacrifices and of the fat of your fine animals. I am tired of the blood of bulls and sheep and goats. Who asked you to bring me all this when you come to worship me? Who asked you to do all this trampling about in my temple? It's useless to bring your offerings. I am disgusted with the smell of the incense you burn. I cannot stand your new moon festivals, your Sabbaths, and your religious gatherings. They are all corrupted by your sins. I hate your new moon festivals and holy days. They are a burden that I am tired of bearing. When you lift your hands in prayer, I will not look at you. No matter how much you pray, I will not listen, for your hands are covered with blood. Wash yourselves clean. Stop all this evil that I see you doing. Yes, stop doing evil and learn to do right. See that justice is done. Help those who are oppressed. Give orphans their rights and defend widow widows. So what does that tell us about what's right to do and what's not so right to do. Ezekiel 16 says basically the same thing. It's condemning Judah for what they're it's doing. More it's colorful just, language. Yeah, what's <laughs> more colorful, but also it says here, as Sodom and her daughters were better off, as I live, said the Lord God, your sister Sodom and her daughters have not done as you and your daughters have done. Behold, this was the guilt of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters had pride, ex excess of food, prosperous ease, but did not aid the poor and the needy. And, and Jesus repeated that yeah. basic message in the New Testament. He said, you know, Capernaum, Bethsaida, Chorazin, if, if the miracles would have been done and you had been done in Sodom go where they, and Gomorrah, they would have repented a long time ago. This, this is, a, just from my reading, this is a constant theme. Whenever God was unhappy with Israel, almost always, we focus on they've wandered after false God, but almost always these are the specific things that are lifted. You're ignoring the widows and the orphans and so on and so forth. It's, it's amazing how that's a constant repetition. So what's the relationship between taking care of widows and orphans and the poor and worshiping God? You're looking towards the outside, not inward, for one thing because you can't see the orphans and the widows unless you look to the outside of yourself. As Jesus said, if you've done it unto the least of these, my brother, and you've done it unto me. So if we value <coughs> God and worshiping is, is tied up in that, then we will have the heart of God to uh, help those in need. Uh, yeah. We're in need. Yep. We don't always know that, but we need to... Well, uh, realize and what our needs are. If you go back to Isaiah 58, now I, I don't have time. We could read the whole chapter. It seems to say very clearly that, you know, and basically what I just read, the same story. If you're, if you're not being fair to the poor and needy, your worship is a waste. 
what you claim to be your worship is a waste. Um, but if my tax dollars are being sent for all of these programs, I had a former brother-in-law who was a county treasurer here, and he said 40% of the tax dollar in this county goes to some form of public assistance. So aren't I doing my part? How much more would I have to do? I'm already giving lots of money to help all these yeah. people and sustaining and supporting these so programs. Are you You're giving off. the money or is it you have to give it by law? <laughs> well, so how are, you, <laughs> how are you taking credit for that? I could move someplace else. <laughs> yeah, uh, all right. One of the criticisms that I read recently was that um, when you allow the government to take over all of these things, then you have giving without love and receiving without humility. Mm -hmm. In fact, people become attached and, and feel that they're entitled to mm -hmm. these sorts of things. When, when it's uh, us giving out of love and the person receiving and realizing the benevolence of that there, it, it's humbling to receive. Yeah. You know, I, I, I took a college course in sociology, mm -hmm. and I remember the professor saying once, he said, the church has failed in its mission in this oh. capacity, and, and uh, I guess the government has had to, to take over. Well, if, you, if, you take, if you believe what it says in the Bible all the way through, then the people who should take care of the poor in each community are the local churches in that community. Mm -hmm. That's the way it should happen. Well, but isn't that you refer to the Old Testament? That's the Old Testament. System. No, I said the whole the, Bible. The whole Bible is like that. James it, talks about it. Yeah. I'm not quite sure that that there was a problem. You know, with the church is not doing that. I think the government moved in and started doing that. Well, uh, it, I might it, be wrong not. about that, but well, the pitch is yeah. you don't want to depend on the kindness of strangers. You know that. <laughs> Somebody's going to take care of you, so we'll put these things in place so that you're assured that you yeah. will have your needs met. Yeah, the thing is, though, that when you have a church and, they're, and each person's going out to actually work, you get a person with it, with the mm -hmm. money. You know, mm -hmm. with the government, they just give you a check and say, there you go, bye. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's all they do. Well, it's to some extent, if, you, if you, that system has destroyed the self-worth of those that are receiving yeah. because they don't ever get the chance to have the joy of a, making it accomplish, accomplishing something. Yeah. You know, it's... Uh, well, look, look, let's jump to the book of Acts for a moment. Now, we're supposed to be focusing on the Old Testament, you know, but look at Acts 20, verse 35. And here's what Paul said, quoting Jesus, supposedly. I have shown you in all things that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak. Remembering the words that the Lord Jesus himself said, there is more happiness in giving than in receiving. Do we believe that? Well, right. it gives you a sense of self-worth if you have something to give. You know, it, Do you have, have you had a personal experience? Do we have personal experiences of we feel better about giving? Well, I don't live with feeling. <laughs> well, how would you describe there's more happiness in giving than in receiving? How would you well, describe I, it? I don't understand that statement myself. I, th I think it's equal both ways. But when you talk about widows and orphans, they can't give back. Yeah. And so well, and you, many, have to, you have to give uh, without their, receiving anything their appreciation, with them. Their appreciation is a tremendous award, a genuine appreciation. And sometimes they don't know how to give appreciation, but mm -hmm. you have to understand yeah. some understanding of, of their un mis un misunderstanding. Well, it'll be nice if they really appreciate it, but some of them don't appreciate yeah. it. They just feel Does like that give us an needed. excuse not to give? Well, no, that's my point. That that's it. That's the only point where you, where you have to give more than you receive because that's just the way it's going to happen. Our our Bible study guide tells another story. One urban church is in a community plagued by gun gun violence. In 2011, the clear prophetic voice of its pastor rang out during an urban ministry congress in a large city. Here are sample thoughts found in his speech. 
Christians must stop the death march, referring to the biblical story of when Jesus stopped the funeral train by the widow named son, Luke 7, 11 to 17. He explained how the church could not sit idly by while street violence escalated in their community. He asked his audience, are we simply a church that stands up to do eulogies? Is it not to ask God, why do you allow suffering? And God says, why do you, speaking to all of us, why do you allow suffering? I would like to say something about uh, some observations on how things are different here and now, at least here in Loma Linda, as compared to, um, we have all these um, char challenges, you know, to take care of the widows and the orphans. And yet, w down at the station where we're feeding homeless people, I'm guessing that very close to 80% of the people that are coming there for food are men. Mm -hmm. And um, certainly we have some mentally ill people coming through. We have people coming through with their ankle monitors. Um, we have um, people, PTSD vet vets in the area. Um, but very, very few women are coming through. The ones that do have such um, a tight, um, fearful, hypervigilant attitude. They, they just seem so vulnerable and, and just really afraid. Mm -hmm. And um, so maybe that's where some of our focus needs to be. I mean, we try to, to single them out mm -hmm. and you know, give them information. But we have a, a very different society at this point in time. I let me second what you've said. As I, you've already said, I've, I've talked way too much about myself already today, but I have a person that I work with at the clinic who spends almost full time helping me. I see patients and she comes like right behind me almost and says, okay, we know you have problems. What about this and what about this? And here's, here's what services are available in the community. Uh, can we help you find a job? Can we help you with housing? Da, 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 da. I mean, and, and this, is, this is an amazing, I mean, what doctor's office has that kind of service? But I have it. And you know, I can second everything you said. I mean, you know, we have, I'm sure there are many people who come regularly to our clinic who really don't need to come that often, but it's probably the safest and the most stable place in their entire lives. Is this a government clinic or is this a university? Well, this is, well it's a, a cooperation between Loma Linda University and the federal government. But it's interesting, to, um, why do you think that there aren't that many women and there's so many men? Is it, I, I are really they scared to come? I, I, no, they uh, got it. They, they would come if they had to, probably. There, there, there's, several reasons. That. there's several reasons for that. One of the reasons is if, if a woman has a child that's under 18, it's almost automatic that she get Medi-Cal, Medicare, and she can get, I mean, Medi-Cal, Medicaid, and she can get various kinds of services because she has a child and stipends to take care of the child and herself and so forth. So there aren't as many of them that are really completely destitute. Mm. Okay. And I think fairly, I think that's why. I mean, that's, that's, part, of the, that's part of the caring for w widows and orphans. <coughs> uh, I mean, it's too bad that the church isn't doing it instead of the, you know, the federal government. But. And it's the men who go off and leave the children in the hands of the women. It's the men who give the women the children and then disappear. Yeah. Come around and, hey, you owe me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, when we get to heaven, will we all be treated equally? Here's an interesting thought. <laughs> if, and I learned this from trying to be a competent parent to two very different daughters. Treating them the same Gotta was not a good thing <laughs> at all because the needs are different yeah. with each individual person. To, so if I say, I'm going to take care of everybody the same, that's not useful. Yeah. I you need can't. to find out what this person needs. Yeah. 
you, you, hopefully you can love them the same, but their needs are not the same. Yeah. yeah. You know, I, when I took a trip to Rome, we were looking at all the, the places, this system where they had slaves and everything, and they had these higher-ups mm -hmm. type of thing. I actually think that when the gospel went out, it was actually the idea that God treated everybody equally was more um, attractive to them than actual eternal life. Mm -hmm. they, they, it was just something crazy that they never heard of before is to have a God that would treat everybody the same. Yeah. And I, I think that's a, that's a really important thing about the, the gospel right there. Well, if in fact everybody's going to be treated equally when we get to heaven, should we start practicing that now? Well, I well, try to. I see, okay. Do I? Uh, well, as Diane said, you know, you, you, if you try to treat everyone the same, you, you run into problems. I, I didn't so, say the same, I said yeah. equally. <laughs> In other words, no, we I, need I to, to love important. one another Yeah, yeah. as Christ loved the church. And he, he dealt with the disciples differently. He had 12 yeah. of them, he had three in an inner circle, and then he had these yeah. others. And well, Ellen White had some interesting things to say in, in, in a, the Pacific Union Recorder and then another place. When the mind of Christ becomes our mind and his works our works, we shall be able to keep the fast described by the prophet Isaiah. Is not this the fast that I have chosen to loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens? Find out what the poor and suffering are in need of, and then, in love and tenderness, help them to courage and hope and confidence by sharing with them the good things that God has given you. Thus you will be doing the very work that the Lord means you to do. Open, and again, let the oppressed go free. Do not rest until you break every yoke. It is not possible for you to neglect this and yet obey God. You know, it's dangerous to help people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. For example, if you have uh, you have some yard work that you would like done, you've got uh, some things that need to be dug up and some other things replanted. <clears throat> if you bring somebody in who isn't bonded and licensed and certificated and insured and everything and something happens, uh, you can end up being their gardener and them living in your house. <laughs> <laughs> you know, right. it's, it's uh, something has happened in, in our yeah. culture that... So what could we do to demonstrate tangible Christianity in our day? We're running out of time, so let's see if we can draw some conclusions. Well, let me ask a question which we haven't asked yet. The Seventh-day Adventist Church has always done much better at evangelizing the poor and needy than we have at reaching the wealthier classes. Is that evidence that we are doing what God has asked us to do? Should we be doing better at reaching out to the rich? Well, Paul had the same problem. He said there's not many noble amongst you. So mm -hmm. apparently in his evangelism, he was getting more poor uh, people than rich as well. I think uh, there's... Jesus said that, you know, it's hard for the rich man to enter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think it's hard for the rich man to to see his need. Yeah. Right. A poor person, their needs are very immediate. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody who has plenty of stuff, and they don't. They don't and and Jesus himself them. said, "The poor, you're going to have them here all the time. You're never going to get rid of all the poor." So, would it be better for us just to focus on spreading the gospel and say the only way to solve the poverty problem? is to have Jesus come back. That would be an easy way out, wouldn't it? <laughs> well, you're not going to solve the poverty problem right. permanently. You can, only, you can only solve what you can do. Mm -hmm. You can only give what, what the Lord has given you to do. And like Ellen White said, you know, the, the way, it's not like we should just skip over and do evangelism. Uh, the, mm -hmm. the, Christ's method alone would uh, re lead su uh, to success where you draw close to the people, meet their needs, and then bid them uh, follow Christ. It's hard to listen when you have a hungry stomach. Yeah. Uh, I, have to, I have to mention one other story that's in our, our Bible study guide. 
1909, Ferdinand and Anna Stahl went as missionaries to the Peruvian Andes. This is a 12,000 foot altitude place up there. Like many other Seventh-day Adventist missionaries, they started with the tried and true method of selling books door to door. The only problem was that they were working among a 95% indigenous population kept in ignorance and poverty by a religious and political aristocracy. Most of the people couldn't read the books that the stalls were offering, so they changed their approach. They started clinics, markets, chapels, and the first coeducational school in the region. They helped break down racial and religious and social barriers. Soon there were some 200 schools dotting Lake Titicaca with thousands of students enrolled in them. The legacy of the stalls has been profound. Many non-Seventh-day Adventist politicians, religious leaders, and educationalists acknowledge the tremendous social impact made by these Seventh-day Adventist missionaries. And I'm quoting, in the face of severe injustice, suffering, and oppression, writes Peruvian theologian Gustav Gutierrez, the stalls were identified with the poorest of the poor and incarnated the gospel in ways which profoundly impacted the spiritual, social, economic, and political life of the Peruvian highlands. Wow. How's that for an example? You know, there are anthropologists, secular anthropologists, that have observed the phenomena that they, uh, the change in the culture and, and yeah. sociology that, that their work did down there. When I first went to Zambia as a missionary in 1970, <clears throat> half of the hospitals and half of the schools in that country were operated by religious organizations. Yeah. Well, we're running out of time. We have raised a lot of questions. And we, not just us, the, the lesson raises a lot of questions. There are a lot of questions that aren't easy to answer. Do we use governmental means to accomplish some things? Do we, do we march in the streets? Uh, we'll talk more about that in a later lesson. Um, in the days of Jesus, he had his, you know, he's talking about the widows and the orphans, and we have various ways of trying to deal with them. But the, the challenge is still given to us, and it's a challenge, challenge to every one of us as individuals. What are we supposed to do? Our kind and loving Father, we thank you so much for the privilege we have of coming together like this and discussing these issues as challenging as they are. Help us to see our way around us and among those that we work with, how we can reach out to the poor, to the needy, and also to the rich. And may we touch their lives so that very soon you will be able to come back again and take us to a home where there will be no problems like that is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.